Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. The word of the Lord reads, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scriptures say to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. This is the word of the Lord. Theologian uh, G.K. Beale once wrote, God has elected us in order to eliminate all boasting, all self-reliance, and all human pride. So it was the summer of uh, 2006, and Kim and I were at that time, pretty new Christians, but we were really excited about our our Christian faith and we were hungry uh, for the Word of God and we were really desiring to grow. Um, And uh, and and, and so we decided then, uh, because of that, to start a little Bible study in our home with a few other Christian couples we knew. There was a couple that were were Christians for many, many years and we felt that they would be good mentors for us. And uh, and when I mean Bible study, I mean what we did was we just took the book, we just took the Bible, we opened it up a book and we read it, and we just kind of like then talked about our feelings of what the Scripture actually said, which, by the way, isn't always the optimal way to do a Bible study, but, uh, but that was the approach that we were taking. And so we decided to study the book of Romans, and, and we met for several weeks, and I began to really take that study serious because it was speaking to my heart, and um, and. and and, and, and I would spend time on my own, you know, thinking about the text and reading it over and over again and, and preparing to study um, for the next week as, as the weeks would go on. And, and, and so I would, I would read the text over and over again, and I would, I would read commentaries that were available to me online, um, you know, and, and help me to get a handle on what the passage was saying. And I was just really, really excited because the, the Scriptures began to come alive to me as I began to study. And, and, and as I read the text and made observations, I became even more excited when I would read in the commentaries the very things that I saw in the text, other people who were smarter than me were seeing the same things in the text. And I was excited you know, to have my own insights kind of confirmed by theologians that I'd never met. Um, and, and so by the time we reached Romans chapter 9, I was really, really excited to talk about the things that I was seeing in, in the passage of Scripture. And, and I remember that, that and, and I want you to realize, like, when I came to faith, I came to faith late in life. So I didn't have, like, a church upbringing and a theology, right? I didn't have an upbringing that shaped my view of the Scriptures. I was just reading the text for what I thought that the text would say, and then I would read commentaries to see if I was on track or if I was off track. And, and, so, uh, and so I did this in, you know, as we prepared week after week. And one evening, I really had a lot of notes, um, and, and I, I, I just couldn't wait. I was so excited to share my observations at the Bible study, and we just happened to be in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. And I was so excited to talk about it. And, and my excitement, though, was very short-lived. <laughs> because again, because as I shared my thoughts with the group, what I was expecting was encouragement and approval for the time that I was spending in the Word. And, um, and, and I was just expecting that the Bible study would just be like, that's, you know, that's really insightful, that's helpful. You know? and, but that is not at all what happened. One of the husbands of, 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 of one of the, the couples that, that I'd known for a few years, uh, somebody who has been a Christian a long time, he exploded in anger. I mean, 
I mean, this is a man I looked up to. He was a veteran Christian, but he stood up and he began to be visibly upset and his voice just kept getting louder and louder and louder. And it really kind of shocked me. I kept thinking, maybe he just misunderstood what I'm saying. Maybe I'm not saying it the right way, right? But this, but, 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 but I began to, to try to explain it more and more. I tried to read the text and show him how I came to my conclusions. And the more I spoke, the more irritated he became and and it baffled me. I mean, I was just, you know, a brand new Christian. Here's this guy, you know, really almost yelling at me. And I was like, what's wrong? Why are you so upset? And he just kept repeating the same thing over and over and over again. He just kept saying, I won't believe in a God like that. I can't believe in a God like that. That's not fair. Everyone deserves a chance. I don't care what the text says. I, it can't mean what that says. And that was the end of our little Bible study. And for the life of me, again, I'm really new to this whole Christian thing at this time. I couldn't understand what the issue was and why he was so upset with me. Why did the clear meaning of the text that seemed so obvious to me, why did it offend him so much? I mean, I must have obviously misread the text because I'm a new guy, right? I must have said something wrong or heretical or something, right? And so I began to, to, to just simply avoid looking at Romans chapter 9 because obviously I wasn't smart enough to decipher that. And obviously there was something I didn't understand. Well, years later, as I came back to Romans and Romans chapter 9, I committed myself to actually pouring into it and studying it really with an effort to understand it from front to back. I wanted to know exactly what it, what it said. And my approach was really, really simple. I just wanted to learn and know what Paul actually wrote down and what he meant by what he wrote. I wanted to understand what Paul was communicating to the audience in the first century. Not what I thought or felt it said, but what he was actually saying to those people regardless of my personal feelings, regardless of anything else, regardless of the pushback that I even experienced from my friends, all right, I wanted to understand. And to the best of my ability, I set aside my personal feelings and assumptions and preconceived ideas, and I studied the text in de detail, seeking to find out what every verse and word meant. Not what I, I thought that it meant, not what I hoped that it meant, not that I, what I wanted it to mean, but what it actually means. And so I studied every paragraph and every sentence and every phrase and every word in English and in Greek. I learned to diagram sentences again, like you were taught back in school and you said, why would I ever have to do this? Well, this is why, right? Uh, I learned to work through Paul's arguments and, and his flow of logic. I learned to try to follow his flow of thought, where he was going from point to point. I learned to try to understand every point that Paul was making in its context. And I began to read more and more and more commentaries, and I listened to many different sermons. And, I, and as a result, I began to read books on theology. And where I ended up is right where I began in the first place with the plain, clear reading of the text in context. I came right back to the same place. Not because I wanted to end up there, but that's just because that's where the scriptures actually led me. All right. But if what I understood then was actually true, then why did this older Christian man who was a friend of mine get so upset? Why did this man who loved Jesus get so upset if the text actually meant what I believed that it meant? If the text is clear as I had understood it to be, which has been confirmed for me, by the way, by many theologians throughout history, if that text is so clear, then why was he moved to such an emotional response? Well, actually, related to that, another thing I've learned over the years um, can be summed up in the words of the late R.C. Sproul. He once said at a conference, what is wrong with the church today is we don't know who God is and we don't know who we are. In other words, we have an insufficient understanding of God and an insufficient understanding of ourselves. Now, he was not saying 
that people don't know God in a saving sense because we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and not by perfect theology. Praise the Lord to that, right? right? We don't have to know everything there is to know about God to be saved. But the essence of what he was saying was one of the biggest problems in the American Christianity is we have spent not enough time studying God and who he has revealed himself to be in his word. In other words, we have a shallow theology of God, a shallow understanding of God. We may know Him and and even be saved by Him, but we don't understand Him to the depths that He would have us understand Him. That for many, our understanding is shallow and superficial. And because we have a shallow understanding of God, then we have a shallow understanding of ourselves. We have a shallow understanding of mankind. Because the truth is, Who we are is actually directly related to who God is. He is the one who created us. He is the one who imagined us. He is the one in which we, in His image, we were created. We were created to reflect Him. So God is ultimately the one. Who He is defines who we are. And so the point is, the problem with American church is our understanding of God is insufficient, and because our understanding of, of God is in, insufficient, our understanding our, of ourselves is also insufficient. And the outworking of this shallow understanding is a weak theology of God. And the outworking of a theology that's weak like that is that many people tend to read the Scriptures from a man-centered point of view rather than a God-centered point of view. And that was the issue with my friend. He wasn't a bad man. He just had a bad theology of God. It wasn't that he didn't love Christ. He just had a very shallow view of God and an elevated view of himself. And And that was the lens that was shaping how he was seeing and understanding the text. He had a weak theology of God that caused him to have a man centered view of the Scriptures. Well, What was the issue then in Romans chapter 9 that made him so upset? Why did he, what was the the thing that Paul was talking about here that, that got him so worked up? It was how Paul answered the objection that many people had to the gospel at the time. If you remember last week, The first eight chapters of the letter, Paul completely explained the gospel in complete detail. He explained what the gospel is. He explained the blessings that the gospel gives to those who believe. He explained how, how the gospel works. He explained the surety of the hope of those who trust in Christ. The surety of those who who trust in the gospel. The first eight chapters of Romans is a master exposition of the gospel by Paul. But there was, at the time, an objection that threatened to undermine the whole thing. And beginning in chapter 9, Paul begins to address that objection. And the objection can be summed up this way. If so many people who were Jewish, who were physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the very people who were given the law, the very people who had the Mosaic Covenant, If they didn't believe the gospel that Paul claims was taught in the Old Testament, if they rejected the gospel, then either the gospel is not true, or if the gospel is true, then God in the Old Testament, His promises has failed. That was the conclusion they had come to. Because the Jews believed themselves to be God's people because of their heritage. They believed that the gospel, if it is true, and so many Jews reject the gospel, then God's promises must have failed. That was the objection to the gospel. And Paul's response to this was to explain that God's promise of salvation has never been about ethnicity. It's never been about biology or family or or, or relationships or nationality or religiosity or even effort. Salvation has always been from the beginning to now always been about God's sovereign election. It has always been about God's sovereign choice. As Paul says so clearly, beginning in verse 10, and not only so, 
but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not born and yet and, and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Paul made it clear that those who become part of his family do so by God's sovereign grace in election. That's the clear meaning of the text. It's right there in front of you. That's the words that he used. He says the purpose of election. God chooses who he wills by his own wisdom and decree. Right? And that was the root of my friend's frustration, the doctrine of election, the idea that God in His wisdom and by His own grace is the deciding factor in salvation, that salvation is 100% of God, that God begins the work and God completes the work and we actually contribute nothing to our own salvation except the sin that makes salvation necessary. And that upset him. And in his words, that's just not fair. Everyone, he said, deserves a chance for God to be the one who elects and chooses seemed to him like God was being unjust. But here's the thing. That objection is not new. That issue is not new. Nearly 500 years ago, one of them dead theologians I was talking about said this, the flesh cannot hear of this wisdom of God without being instantly disturbed by numberless questions and without attempting in a manner to call God to account. The objection is something that the church has been wrestling with for centuries, even all the way to the beginning. In fact, this is the objection we find Paul addressing in this section of the text and also in the next, God's election to salvation. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9, and we'll look and we'll see this. Beginning in verse 14, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? The truth of God's salvation, His election to salvation, is something that people have been wrestling with for 2,000 years. In fact, this issue is so common that Paul makes a point to bring it up himself. That Paul had heard this objection so often that he didn't wait for people to ask. He actually asked it himself. And here, here's the gist of it. If God elects or chooses those who He will to be part of His family, regardless of who they are or what they do, then doesn't that make God unjust? Doesn't that make Him unrighteous? Doesn't it make Him unfair? That's the essence of the question. You see, whenever the topic of sovereignty in salvation is brought up, no matter what century, there are two objections that people typically raise to this truth. Number one, that's not fair. Right? God isn't fair or God isn't just. Right? That's always the first one. The second one is this. If the doctrine is true, then God, and God chooses who He wills, then mankind really can't be held responsible for His sin. That's the second objection. Those are the two issues that, that have been raised by people for centuries, and Paul addresses both of these head on. In the next section, Paul's going to address man's responsibility in light of God's election, and we're going to talk about that and explore that next week. Um, but he addresses the issue of God's justice or fairness in the passage before us today. And again, Paul is, in his diatribe, asked the question that his imaginary Jewish opponents would have asked him at the time. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Is God unjust? Is He unrighteous for what He does? If God elects some to salvation according to His will and not others, as you say, doesn't that mean that He's unfair? That's the essential question. And that's the essence, that's the essence of my friend's outburst. If God saves according to His purpose of election, is He unrighteous? And so it seems, on the surface, that might be a fair question. It actually seems like it might be an objective question, but, but really, is it objective? And the truth is, it's not. This question isn't objective at all. Because this question betrays some assumptions. You see, this question doesn't exist in a vacuum. 
This question comes from a perspective of the world. This question comes from a worldview. It comes from a view of God and a view of man. And, and let's be honest, right? To ask this question assumes three basic things. First, it assumes that we, the creature, can sit in judgment of God, the Creator. That's what it assumes. That we somehow have the moral authority to call God to account. That we can sit in the position of judge and question like someone who put somebody on the witness stand. As if God owes us an explanation. By the way, if you read the book of Job, you'll find out that's not how it actually works. Because Job tried that exactly thing to, to, to call God to account and he ended up finding out that he had no business even talking. Paul actually will address that even further in the next section. Number two, this assumes that somehow God is obligated to mankind in some way, that somehow God owes us something. This question assumes that God is obligated to explain himself to us or that he owes us answers. It assumes that God is obligated to treat everyone exactly the same. That's how we kind of define fairness, by the way. We just think that everybody has to be treated exactly the same, no matter what. That if God gives grace to one person, then he better give grace to everyone else. That's, that's what we assume. If God does something for one person, then he's unfair if he doesn't do it for everybody else. But the scriptures make it clear that God is not obligated to us in any way. God doesn't owe us anything but his justice and his wrath. That's what he owes us. That's it. Not to mention grace. If grace is an obligation then it's not grace. You, you realize that, right? If grace is something that's obligated, then it's not actually grace. It's a debt. It's an obligation, but it's not grace. And, and God is not indebted to, to anyone. Number three, the, thing, the third thing this assumes is, is that this question assumes that God doesn't have the right to choose as He wills. That's what it assumes. That God doesn't have the right to do, to do whatever He desires to do. But when you survey the Scriptures, what you're going to find is that God can do what He wants, when He wants, how He wants, with whom He wants, for whatever reason that He wants. The pictures that the Scriptures paint of, is a God who is sovereign and omnipotent and omniscient and eternal and the creator of all things. And He can do whatever He pleases to do. But this question assumes that he can't. And so right from the beginning, we can see that this objection assumes a man-centered view and a man-centered theology, whether it's conscious or whether, whether it's something unconscious. It assumes a worldview that is centered on man rather than God. It assumes that God, in essence, exists to serve man. That, by the way, is the reason why the most common theological belief in Christianity is called moralistic therapeutic deism. That our relationship with God is to make us better people, that God is here to help us to live our better lives, and that God kind of exists as a waiter in the closet to, to help us when we need Him. That's the most common view in all America. That's what the research betrays. It, it assumes that somehow God exists to serve us. It assumes that creation is about man and our happiness rather than God's glory. It assumes that man is owed an explanation. It assumes that man is owed a second chance, that man is owed happiness, that man is owed the right to live your best life now. And it assumes that mankind is basically good and that man just simply occasionally makes some mistakes. But this view of reality is very, very shallow. And it's shallow because it's based on an insufficient view of who God himself is. A view that Paul seeks to correct in his response here. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. In the Greek, this expression is as emphatic as you can possibly make it. He denies this clearly and emphatically. Like, you can't express it any more strongly than that. And then he explains this denial by appealing to the Scriptures once again. 
Paul doesn't use his opinion or, the, or, or philosophy to explain himself. He goes right to the source, the scriptures. And he says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Paul, in addressing this objection, is appealing to, to Exodus chapter 33. Actually, 32 and 33 are connected, and the, the story flows from there. This is where Moses is making intercession for the nation of Israel before God after the scandal of the golden calf. Now, if you grew up in church, as many of you did, then you understand the story of the golden calf. But just in case you're not familiar with it, let me just kind of give you a brief thumbnail sketch. Moses was the chosen one by God to lead the nation of Israel out of captivity. And he did lead them to freedom, and he led them through the Red Sea as the Red Sea was parted by God's sovereign power. And then he led them to Mount Sinai by God's direction. And it was on Mount Sinai that God called Moses up to meet with him so that God could give him the law, the Mosaic law. Right? And, it was, and it was this time that, um, that the, the Ten Commandments was, was given and while Moses was up on the mountain, the nation of Israel became rebellious and asked Aaron to make for them a golden, make them a god that they could follow, an idol. And Aaron made them a golden calf. And so he gave in to their, their desire for idolatry and they worshiped it. And the text says, beginning in verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside out of the way that I might, that, that I have commanded them. I have, they have made them for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are our gods, O Israel, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Israel had sinned greatly before God and they deserved the very worst consequences. They deserved to be consumed and eradicated on the spot. They deserved to be wiped out and blotted out. But God didn't wipe them out. Why? Because He showed mercy to them instead. He didn't give them justice. He gave them mercy. And it's in light of that that God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, Paul answers this question of God's justice and fairness by appealing to God's mercy. He says God is not unjust because He's merciful right? and shows mercy on whom He decides to show mercy. He has compassion on whom He shows compassion. Now, some might think, well, that really doesn't answer the question, but, but it does. Because, the, because the, the question is rooted in a man-centered view of reality. But the truth is, God does not save sinners because of His justice. You understand that? God does not save sinners because of His justice. God does not save sinners because of His fairness. God saves sinners because of His mercy. The theologian John Stott put, put it this way. He says, The question of God's justice for saving some and not others is misconceived because the basis on which God deals savingly with sinners is not justice but mercy. God does not save us out of His justice. He saves us out of His mercy. And I know that seems like a simplistic thing to say, but you really have to think this through. If salvation was based on God's justice, we are all lost. If salvation is based on justice, we're all, we ought to be dead in, in hell right now. Because that's what we deserve. That's what we deserve. This is, this is where we have to fix our theology. Mankind is not a creature that is intrinsically good who occasionally makes some bad mistakes. Mankind has been thoroughly corrupted by sin. That's not my opinion. Remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? The devil. The devil. 
the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul says we were all born in sin, and because of that, we were under God's wrath. How about what he says in Romans chapter 3? Remember that? Paul summarizes the universal problem of all of mankind. He writes, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And then he goes on to say, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I can, I can go on and on, but we already talked about at length that, that Paul explained, as he explained the gospel in Romans, he spent the better part of three chapters unpacking the bad news of the gospel that all of mankind is sinful and under God's justice and wrath. The bad news that mankind is thoroughly sinful and deserving of His justice. Mankind is not basically good and occasionally sins. Mankind is completely covered in sin in nature and in action, and only does the good that we do because God's mercy and His grace restrains us from being as bad as we can be. And if you don't believe me, you know what I'm talking about. You're not as bad as you can be because God restrains you in many different ways. All right? God's restraint is the reason why you don't take your car and ram it into somebody when they cut you off on the 14 freeway. Right? God's Restraint is the reason why that you don't throat punch somebody when they say something the wrong way to you, right? There's a lot of things you don't do because you're being restrained by God's, by God's grace. Mankind is not basically good. All mankind has fallen short of God's righteous standard, which is moral perfection. That's the standard, by the way. It's moral perfection. And, and God, by contrast then, compared to us, God is completely holy and righteous. God is completely perfect and morally pure. God is completely sinless and He is just. And because He is just, He cannot allow sin to go unpunished. The psalmist tells us, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you. Uh, Excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verse 8, we're told, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Romans 2, verse 5, But because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You see, actual reality is defined by three basic truths. Number one, God is holy, righteous, and just. That is the way it is. That's who He is. Number two, in light of that, in light of God's character, mankind is not only covered in sin, but actively rebels against God and refuses to worship Him and give thanks to Him. Man is covered in sin. And number three, God's justice requires that sin be punished. These are three immutable, unchangeable truths. And because those things are true, if salvation then is based on God's justice, we're all done for. We're all lost. If salvation was based on God's justice, we are all dead. God's justice demands that we pay the price for sin. And Paul says the wages of sin is what? Death. Physical and spiritual death. And so salvation is not based on God's justice, it's based on His mercy. Well, well, what then is the definition of mercy? Mercy is a very simple concept. Mercy is when you don't get what you rightly deserve. It's when we are not given the punishment that we rightly deserve. That is mercy. That's the basis on which we are saved, by the way, God's mercy. We rightly deserve justice. We rightly deserve wrath. We rightly deserve to spend eternity separated from God and His love. And God owes us nothing but justice and wrath. But God, by His own free will and by His grace, offers us 
mercy. In fact, notice what Paul says next. He says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Our salvation doesn't depend on our desire to be saved. It's not about us wanting it bad enough. It's not about our effort to, to make God love us either. And, and the reason why, reason for that is because our desire for salvation cannot free us from the power and the penalty of sin. Right? We're told all the time in sports, you just need to want it bad enough. Well, in this case, you can't want it bad enough. And then as we talked about, we don't possess the ability within us to do enough good deeds to overcome our bad deeds. It is not in us to be able to make the cosmic scales balance out. It amazes me how so many people still believe that, that if I'll just do enough good deeds and somehow, some way, it'll outweigh my bad. You will never able, you're never going to be able to accomplish that. You cannot earn God's favor by your effort. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves or warrant salvation. That's the clear teaching what, what Paul has been communicating throughout Romans. And so the only way to be saved is by God who has mercy. We are literally at the mercy of God. Which means then, we don't have a standing on which to question Him. We don't have the right to ask Him, to ch why do you choose some and not others? He simply says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It is his sovereign choice. And again, if it were about fairness, then God would have given us what we all deserve and wouldn't save anyone. I remember a time when there was a school administrator that I knew. He had to deal with a very serious issue at his school. And, a, and, and, and I'm even serious, like there was a student that brought a gun to school. Right? Now, he didn't do anything with it, but he showed it off to all his friends and to a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of them, they actually got together and they thought it would be smart and cool to get in the parking lot of the school and then take this kind of gang style photo. You know what I'm talking about, where those kids, where kids act stupid and they're doing gang signs and one of them's holding a gun. And, 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 and even more than that, right, in their teenage brilliance, they decided, let's post this on Instagram, on the internet for the world to see, right? Well, somebody actually saw it and informed the school and the students were questioned about this and uh, there, there were punishments that were handed out, and some of them were very severe. A couple of the students were outright expelled. Boom, done. Can't come back. And even law enforcement was called, and I think that, that there, there were some consequences because of that. Another student was offered, because, um, because of mercy, was offered a second chance agreement and faced suspension and lost many of his senior privileges. He wouldn't be expelled, but he would just barely be able to walk with his class. Right? But then there was one student who just basically faced a brief suspension. That was it. Well, the mom of the student who faced suspension and the loss of senior privileges, she called this administrator, and she chewed him up one side and down the next. And she called him everything in the book but a human being, if you know what I mean. And, and, and she just screamed and screamed, it's not fair, it's not fair, because her son was, was being punished more than this other student who didn't receive quite a severe punishment. And after about 10 minutes, the administrator finally said, you just need to shut up, right? I wish I could do that sometimes, you know? But, <laughs> but he's like, you just need to shut up, right? And then he goes, you want me to be fair? Fine, I'll give you fair, I'll expel everyone. That's fair. That's what I'll do. Because that's the fair thing to do. Everybody gets expelled. Everybody gets turned in for charges and will punish everybody to the fullest extent of the law. Is that what she wants? Suddenly, fairness was not what she was interested in anymore. What she wanted was mercy. Right? If it were about fairness, we would all be lost. Right? But praise the Lord that, that for His mercy. Right? Praise the Lord that salvation doesn't depend on our desire or effort. Praise the Lord that God in His mercy decreed to do for us the things that we couldn't do for ourselves. Praise the Lord that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live a perfect, sinless life that we're required to live, but we can't live. Praise the Lord that, that He fulfilled the covenant of works that Adam failed to fulfill and, and that, that He kept the law on our behalf a law that we have all failed to keep and still fail to keep. 
praise the Lord that Christ came to live a righteous life, but also to die for our sins. Praise the Lord that Jesus willingly went to the cross in our place and took upon Himself all of our sins, past, present, and future. Praise the Lord that He made atonement by His own blood. Praise the Lord that God in His righteous anger poured out His wrath that we deserve on His own Son who cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Praise the Lord that He was pleased to crush Him and forsake Him so that we could be forgiven and accepted. Praise the Lord that on the cross, God's justice and mercy embraced. Christ received the justice we deserve so that we could be shown mercy. Remember the hymn that we love to sing, Turn your eyes to the hillside, where justice and mercy embraced. There the Son of God gave His life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Do we really want fairness, or do we want mercy? Salvation is the undeserved grace and mercy of a holy, righteous God. And in light of that, who are we to question who He, by His own wisdom, and by his own will, chooses to have mercy on. Now, for me, reading that, <laughs> for me, that would have been enough to answer the question. But Paul, in his classic style, he's not content to just make the point. He wants to leave no doubt, and he hammers the point home, and he writes, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy for, or because, the Scripture says to Pharaoh... For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now the first part, oh, what was that? Now the first part of this text. Now in the first part of this text, we see a positive example of God's mercy. God spared the nation of Israel even though they deserved wrath, right? But in this part that we see here, there's a negative example that God withholds His mercy from Pharaoh. That's what we see, right? And and let's be honest. This is the part of the whole equation, the whole story that tends to hit some people in the gut. This is the part that rubs some people the wrong way. I mean, we're all good with God having mercy, but God hardening someone... Now, that's a thought that some people just struggle to be able to reconcile. And this tends to trigger that same reflex again, that reflex to shout, that's not fair! That's not right! That's not just! But not only have we demonstrated that salvation is not about fairness, it's about mercy. And not only have we demonstrated that we don't have the moral ground to stand on, to question what God does, and not only have we demonstrated that God owes us nothing but justice and wrath, Paul is going to make it clear that God has the right to use sinful people and their rebellion against Him for His own glory. Look again what, what, what he says here. For this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. I have raised you up for this reason, that my power and glory might be seen and that my name might be proclaimed. And the natural result of the proclamation of the name of the Lord is that others would turn and be saved. God foreordained to use Pharaoh's rebellion that he commits by his own free will to bring glory to Himself, and to bring others to salvation. God has the right to do that. He is free to choose. But lest you think that this makes God a moral monster, there's more to think about here. God, even though He uses Pharaoh and his rebellion for His glory rather than saving him, God was still good to Pharaoh. This is the part that a lot of people just want to look past because we have our own definitions of fairness because we don't see things the way that God does. God was good and gracious and merciful to Pharaoh. Again, that might shock you, but it's the truth. If you really understand who God is and understand who you are in light of who God is, it makes sense. Because who is Pharaoh? He was a man 
born in sin like the rest of us. He rebelled against God by his own free choice and will. God didn't make him do it. He worshipped false gods all the way to the end. He enslaved and oppressed a nation that God had set apart to represent him. He committed atrocities that are unspeakable. He refused also then to acknowledge God as God showed his power. He refused to acknowledge God. Pharaoh earned by his own actions and by his free will and decisions the wrath that God promised, the the death that his sin deserves. But yet, we forget that God gave him the breath of life. That God in His grace sustained Pharaoh all his life with every heartbeat, with every breath. God placed him in a royal family. He lived a life of luxury and wanted for nothing. He ate the finest food. He drank the finest wine. He wore the best clothing and jewelry. He was famous, he was powerful, he was rich. He was all the things that most people around us want to be. And he had everything that most of the people around us want to have. He lived a life that that, that people envy. He lived a life that people would kill for, that people would die for. And all of the things that he had were gifts from the sovereign hand of God. And more than that, he experienced the common grace that all of us experience. He felt the warmth of the sun on a cool spring morning, which is going to be more relevant to us in the coming weeks, right? He felt the refreshing sensation of cool water on his lips and in his tongue and his mouth on a super hot, dry day. He experienced the joy of laughter, the blessing of friendship, the exquisite taste of food. He was comforted by the embrace of people that he loved. He knew the intimate love of his wife and the joy that comes from that union. Like all humans, Pharaoh was blessed in more ways than he could possibly count or imagine. God was merciful to him for many years of his life. God withheld the judgment that he rightly deserved for years and years and years and years. God was gracious because he blessed Pharaoh with many blessings, none of which he deserved. But in spite of all of this, in spite of God's goodness, Pharaoh still rebelled against God. As as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, For although he knew God, and he did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but he he became futile in his own thinking, and his foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, he became a fool, and he exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Make no mistake, God was good to Pharaoh as He is to everyone else. God was gracious and merciful to him, but God owed him nothing but His justice and wrath. Now, will someone say, well, you know, I know that. I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with the fact is that God says that He hardened Pharaoh. God made Pharaoh what He was. But again, that's a misunderstanding of how God operates. Again, let's look back to Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, and because God has shown it to them for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they're without excuse. Nobody has an excuse. Nobody does. For although they knew God, they didn't honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, in light of that, God, I want you to hear this, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You see, God pours out His wrath on those who were ungodly by giving them over to their sin. He gives them over to what they already want. He gives them up to the passions and desires they already have. God simply just lets them go to their own destruction. 
That's what it means to harden someone. It means to just let them go, right? And it's the same with hardening a Pharaoh. God didn't make him take a man who was willing to follow God, who desired to be righteous and who was willing to, to, to follow where God leaded. God hardened a man who already hated him and wanted nothing to do with him. You see, it's like this. God hardening Pharaoh was in a sense like respecting his wishes. I think we kind of know what this is like when somebody we know, you know, that we love or that we care about is bent on doing something really stupid. And man, you're like, don't do it. Come on. Don't be stupid. Oh, but you know, oh, but you know, and, and you just can't talk them out of it. They're just bent on doing stupid things. And then finally, what do you do? You're like, okay, fine. Have it your way, right? That's the idea. God doesn't actively make Pharaoh's hard my heart hard. It was already hard. God just simply allows Pharaoh to just be Pharaoh and do what he wants to do anyway. John Stott is really helpful, and he says this way. He says, Pharaoh hardened his heart against God and refused to humble himself is made plain in the story. So God's hardening of him was a judicial act of abandoning him to his own stubbornness. Much of God's wrath against the ungodly is expressed, in his, is, is, is expressed by giving them over to their depravity. So again, God was not malicious or capricious or unjust or unfair in how he treated Pharaoh. In fact, God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart to his own destruction is actually God's righteousness and justice in action because he gave Pharaoh what he deserved. Pharaoh deserved exactly what he deserved, justice. And the thing that we need to understand and the thing that we need to see is we all, 100% of humanity, deserve the same thing. We deserve the same kind of justice. We deserve for God to simply abandon us to our sins and our desires and our lusts. We deserve for God simply to allow us to do what we want to do before we were redeemed and live in the rebellion we lived in. We deserve the death that, war that our sin warrants. And if God would have done that, He would be perfectly righteous and He would be completely just and He would be completely fair. But for some reason, God, in His own wisdom, in His own love, ordained to glorify Himself by being merciful to some of those creatures that deserve justice. God has ordained to withhold that judgment that we rightly deserve and place that judgment on His own Son so that we could be spared. Again, John Stott sees this so clearly. He says, the wonder is not that some are saved and others are not, but that anyone is saved at all. You see, we shouldn't be troubled by the question of why God would have mercy on some and not others. What should trouble us is why would anyone be saved at all? because none of us deserve it. And I've said this many times, and I'll say it again, probably until I die. I don't struggle with the question of the triune nature of God. How can God be one God in three persons? It doesn't bother me. It's what the Word says. I take Him at His Word. Right? I don't struggle with the fact that Jesus, when He came in the world, became He was fully God and became fully man. That He is both has a full divine nature and a full human nature, and those natures exist in one person, but those natures don't cross or ever mix or mingle. I don't exactly know how it works, but I don't struggle with it. It's what God said that said is the truth, and I take Him at His word. I don't struggle with the fact that God is sovereign and in complete control of all things. He knows all things. Nothing happens without His consent. That doesn't bother me. Why? Because that's what the Bible says clearly about Him. I take Him at His word. The thing, though, that I still struggle with to this very day is why would a holy, righteous, and just God kill His own Son to save a jerk like me? I mean, seriously, if I was suddenly lifted to heaven right now and God said, Sherman, you're guilty of breaking my law and I sentence you to an eternity in hell, I would have no argument or defense. I would have nothing to offer God that, 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 that could persuade him. I wouldn't even venture to open my mouth. 
I would have nothing to say, but your will be done. Because I have, I have earned by my own sin in my life God's righteous wrath and anger. And all the positive things I might have ever done can never atone for that. If God refused to give me mercy, I would have no complaint because I don't deserve His mercy. I especially don't deserve for God to crush His own Son on my behalf so that I could go free. I know who I am. I know who I've been. And I know what I'm still capable of if left up to my own devices. As Paul says, not for the grace of God. Right? But God in His Word promised that I, a sinner, if I would repent and believe the gospel, if I, a sinner, would believe the truth about Christ and what He did for me, and if I would put my trust in Him alone for salvation, that I would be saved. That's what He promised. No strings attached, by the way. It's not, hey, you need to believe, and now you need to start following a bunch of rules. Right? It's not, you need to believe, and you need to try really, really, really hard never to sin again. Like, there's no strings attached to this. If you put your faith in Christ and you put your faith in Christ alone for salvation, Jesus said, right, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have, present tense, in that moment, the moment they believe, eternal life. And so I take God at His word and I believe. It's just that simple. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I'll tell you that every single day. I don't deserve it. But God has had mercy on me, a sinner. And I've been saved by, the, by grace through faith and not by my own works. And by the way, that was a gift of God. And the only thing I have to, to boast in is, is Christ. As, as Beale again puts it, God's, God elects us in order to eliminate all boasting, all self-reliance, and all human pride. And so, the, hear me, the doctrine of election doesn't bother me. In fact, it's a great comfort to me because it was God by His love that chose me. And if He didn't choose me, I would have never chosen Him. I would still today be the child of wrath. That's why one of my all-time favorite new hymns is when we sing very often, all I have is Christ. I want you to hear these words with fresh ears today. I once was lost in darkest night, yet I... Yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. But if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. And now all I know is grace. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. Brothers and sisters, we tend to get ourselves sideways trying to ask questions of God that we'll never understand, forgetting it's just that simple. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel and you'll be saved. That's the simple. You want to be elect? You want to be one of the ones that God has mercy on? Repent and believe the gospel and God's had mercy on you. It's that simple. And so if you're not in Christ today, my call is always the same. Turn to Him and put your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone and He will save you. And He will guide you and He will lead you and He will put His Spirit inside of you guaranteeing that you belong to Him and that you can have hope eternal. And for the rest of you who are in Christ, as I said over and over again, let not legalism plague your mind or antinomianism for that matter, but rest in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Trust in Him, believing that He did what He said that He would do and that He is the King that He promised to be and that your hope is secure in Him. Let me pray. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. 
Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.